Anybody after doesn't, 
Yeah, uh, the, the way that the medical subsidy, it's, a, it's, a, it's an insurance premium offset. And you may be aware, um, our law states that when somebody retires you know, from a town or a school district, they have the right to stay on the employer's group insurance plan, you know, the plan they were on when they were working. Uh, they may have to pay the full cost out of pocket. Some employers may or may not subsidize a little bit for one service employees. That's, that's probably gone away over the last 10 years. But So it, it's a premium offset. So the retiree has to be getting benefits from the la their last employer and paying for it. And the subsidy, we pay that directly to the insurance company so there's less of a deduction from their pension. That's how the, the plan was set up. It's a little different for state employees, but for the purposes of this conversation. So the legislature closed the medical subsidy for employees back in sort of the mid early early to mid 2000s and for teachers you had to retire by July 1st of 2009. So uh, we have about a um, little bit under maybe 9,500 of our 40,000 plus retirees are subsidy, subsidy eligible. Some of these people may be getting coverage elsewhere and not collecting it, but it's a closed group. So eventually, you know, the subsidy reduces when people become Medicare eligible and their, their insurance becomes a Medicare supplemental plan to Medicare. So as people age into the post 65 and eventually pass away, the subsidy will go away because nobody be eligible to receive it, but that's still decades away. But it is a sort of a cost that that's declining, you know, year over year. And, um, you know, yeah, so that, that, that's, <laughs> I'll stop there. Okay. You may not be able to answer this, so just curious. I mean, for people on Social Security, it's based on 30 years of work, of pay. So when they increased it from three to five years, why five? Why not? Do you know why they didn't consider like seven or ten or anything like that? Um, most states, it's they're, they're in that three to five range. So I don't know if they were looking at other states to do that or other you know model legislation from from groups things like that. I, I'm not sure. Are there any states that are longer than five? There may be. No, but there's also something unique about Social Security is that they do in they inflation adjust your earlier years in the work in your 35 year work history. Okay. So we don't do that because we have the shorter window that we look at to capture the ages to calculate the benefit. Now, if someone is on a pension. Once they start earning Social Security, does that impact their pension? Does it get reduced at all? No. The, okay. the, 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 used, the original statute did have an offset for Social Security in it, and that was one of the benefit changes in 1989 that I, I referenced on one of the slides. They, they delinked NHRS benefits from Social Security back in 1989. Um, if you were a higher earner and, um, you know, earned more than the Social Security contribution, you could see a, an offset in your NHRS pension, you know, 10, 20, up to 40 percent. Um, but that, that was eliminated. But the legislature did keep for our employee and teacher members a 10 percent reduction in the pension commencing at age 65. So it's not tied to Social Security, but it's a remnant of when the full retirement age was 65 back then. It's 67 for everybody. Yeah, I just now. happened to be talking to a neighbor, and he said when he turned 65, he got a cut. Didn't say by how much, and that surprised me. Yeah, it's a 10%, it's a okay. approximately 10% reduction. Basically, the statute calls on us to recalculate the benefit using a, a larger divisor, so it brings the benefit down. Okay, thank you. Just uh, yeah, a couple of uh, comments. First of all, um, I'm currently retired from Group 2, and I was uh, an enrollee from about 1970, so I've been following this um, up until the present time. Um, you were very gracious in your description of the uh, differential uh, accounting and actuarial methods that were used, um, somewhat um, shaded towards being inadvertent and like a babe in the woods, when in reality um, that was done very, very uh, knowingly by a specific um, administration to uh, make things look a lot better than they were during economic times that were somewhat stressful. Um, so that was done um, not without any knowledge. Um, secondly, I'm glad that you said that um, you really never had to uh, meet your actuarial demand, projected demands. Um, 
and this brings me to the unfunded mandate in setting that, I have to ask people, <coughs> excuse me, I have to ask people that um, New York Life is a very profitable company. If everyone who is insured by New York Life dropped dead tomorrow, they wouldn't be able to meet their obligations. So where do we have an unfunded, unfunded mandate and where do we have good actuarial projections? And I think that that's important to look at. I think the other thing is that we need to understand that all of these situations that put school boards, city councils, boards of selectmen, everybody in difficult shape right now, we're there through absolutely no fault of our own or the voters. That is, I think, quite evident. We, and we had nothing to do with this. The people who voted had nothing to do with this. This was something that transpired um, as a, a blind issue. Um, and, and that was about all I was going to say, but uh, Bruce, what uh, you would ask for. The other thing, though, is that I think people should be aware of is that in some instances, like for instance in a group two, is that there's no reduction in benefits. However, the federal government has what's called the WEP, and the WEP reduces one's eligible benefits from Social Security, even if they have the number of required quarters in to be um, fully retired. So, and that's substantial. Uh, that can be up to 83 percent. So, um, it's not like there's give and take in both sides there. So I think we need to be understand and understand how that works. Thank you. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, Group Two police and fire members in the country do not participate in Social Security. So they're neither they or the employer are contributing. So they're not earning Social Security credits for their Group Two service. If they're under employment and, and qualify either you know pre or post, with enough queries, there is a significant Social Security offset for the years outside of Social Security that they worked. Um, to my knowledge, all uh, schools in New Hampshire, with the exception of one. Uh, do participate in Social Security for their, their staff and their teachers. I have a quick question. Um, is this working? I'll just I'll speak a lot later. Okay. Okay. <laughs> With respect to the metric pertaining to the number of uh, members versus the benefit recipients, um, where do we stand in that regard? In other words, people paying in versus people that are actually getting the benefits. Is that on a national basis a fairly typical ratio? The 40,500, I'm sorry, 41,000 versus 48,000? Yeah, I'll be getting there just to cover oh, okay. if you don't mind. That's fine. Thank you. I'm wondering. So 2022 is similar to 2020, 20, 2007, 2008. Um, what are your feelings about where we're heading in 2022? I'll cover that a little bit later, but I'm certainly keeping an eye on it as much as you know, everyone else is. Um, and one thing that you know, markets are even more volatile than they've ever been, um, you know. Uh, so that, that's that's a concern. That's, that's a recognition that the board. Those, that's one of the reasons the board made the assumption of return multiple times. When I started at NHLS in 2010, it was eight and a half percent a year, and that was. On, and actually, there's a side about this area, but I was on the high end of systems across the country, and you know, it's six and three quarters now, which was on the low end of the spectrum when that decision was made a couple years ago by our board. A lot of plans are continuing to lower the assumption of return to. to because of the, you know, the, the risk and volatility volata of the markets these days. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jan to, to get you the, the most recent numbers we have. And I, I will caveat that even on it, well, first of all, there's a typo on this one. The top bullet should say 0630 of 22, um, not 620. But we're in the, sort of on the shoulder of getting all of our audited information, you know, blessed by the external auditor and in from the actuary. So the numbers, the 20, FY22 numbers where we have them, we've put them into the slides, but we still uh, haven't got everything audited for 21, so the numbers would change a little if we did this presentation in a month. Not that dramatically, though. 
Thank you, Marty. I think the two take home lessons from the history is the importance of having good actuarial assumptions and paying that employer contribution consistently over time. So as Marty said, um, we are on a fiscal year which ends June 30 every year and so as of the end of this fiscal year our assets are approximately 10.8 billion dollars we did have a negative investment return in fisc for this past fiscal year. However, it did exceed what we were expecting to get. Our, our benchmark, we had just been invested in everything according to our policy targets. Our return then would have been nine point, negative 9.3%. So we did do better than our benchmark. And we also did well relative to our peers. There's the count public fund um, sponsor group which is uh, 111 large public pension plans we did better than two-thirds of them for fiscal year 2022 and looking over a longer time horizon because it's not just any one year that counts it's how you're doing over time so over the past 10 years our investment return was 8.5 percent which puts us in the top 20 percent of our peers but it's even more than doing better than our peers is that 8.5 percent that we realized over the 10-year period that was higher than our expected return of 6.75 percent so i just want to keep that in perspective and as Marty said, we're, we're working on the 30-year amortization. We're in the, in the 14th year. We have finally turned the corner. Our unfunded liability did decrease last year. It went down to $5.72 billion. So, here's a, so we're beginning through a few different actuarial metrics. So one of the things that actuaries do, and you'll see the reason why when we get to the slide on investment returns, is they like to look at everything but over a five-year period. So when they come, they put together our metrics, our funded ratio, our unfunded liability, that's on a smooth basis over five years, looking at the investment returns over those five years and the value of our investments over five years. It's not just by pure 10.75 billion as of June 30, 2022. It's what it was over the last five years because it takes a lot of volatility out. So last year, our funded ratio was 64.2%. So that means for every dollar of benefits that we are going to pay in the future, based on the present value of all of the benefits that have been earned, we had 64 cents in the bank. However, it's not just the funded ratio at any point in time that counts, it's what is the trend. And fortunately for us, because of the actions that the legislature has taken and that our employers pay their contribution rates in full every year, we are on the path to getting to 100% funding. We currently have uh, 48,582 members as of last year, and that number, as you will see in a future slide, has been still fairly steady. It hasn't been changing much. In contrast, the number of benefit recipients has been increasing on a regular basis. So we have approximately 41,000 retirees as of last year. And there's also 900 million in the annual pension and medical subsidy benefits that we pay over the year to all of our retirees. So a total annuitant payroll of $900 million. The important thing for the New Hampshire economy is that fully 80% of those retirees stay here in New Hampshire. And according to the National Institute on Retirement Security, they do this really interesting report every year called Pensionomics, and it looks at the impact that a state, each state's retirees have on their state's economy. And so the numbers from their 2021 report are pretty telling. So our pension recipients who stay here in New Hampshire and spend their money 
that was responsible for 8,495 jobs with a total payroll of $493 million. So that's a significant impact on the New Hampshire economy. And this year, just in contrast, we had $924 million in benefits that were paid for this past fiscal year. And this slide shows how our active members and benefit recipients have changed over time. As I noted earlier, you can see the light blue line, that's basically not moving. That, so we're not seeing an increase in the number of our active employees over time. It's, it's holding steady. But you do see the increase in retirees. But within that light blue line, there are some differences. We are seeing slow but steady increases in the group two members, the police and fire, and teachers are slowly declining. And I think you probably see that here in your school district, that you're not having you know, increased numbers of enrollment in teachers. Next slide, please. And so this is a great story about our assets. Even though this year was a very challenging year, we are seeing steady, regular growth in our assets, and these are on an unsmooth basis. This is the actual fair market value at the end of each fiscal year. So we reached an all-time high last June in 2021 and had a slight decline this year for June 2022. Next slide, please. So one question that um, stakeholders often ask is, okay, if your funded ratio is 64.2%, how does that compare to other states? And this slide shows that answer. So in the past, we've definitely been trailing our national peers. You can see, if you look back to 2012, we're almost 17 points below what the national median was. But we have closed that gap, and now it's just 10.7% difference because of all of the changes that were made in 2011 and before, and the commitment that we've had to pay those full contributions on, in, in full on, on time each year. Next slide, please. So this is the slide that I was alluding to earlier about the volatility and the investment returns. This shows you why our actuaries like to take the investment performance and the assets each year and smooth them out over five years. Because if we were basing our employer contribution rates on any given year, we would be seeing wild swings in the employer contribution rates, and which would be a budgetary nightmare for you, as well as every other school district in New Hampshire. So because we do that, we set the rates every two years based on the years before's five year smooth rates, we see much less volatility than we would have otherwise. Thank you. So th this next slide goes through the different elements of the employer rates. There's four different pieces. The first piece is the normal cost, and that's the employer's share of the normal cost. The actual convention is that the employees, the members, their contribution goes entirely towards the normal cost. So if you add the employee cost plus the employer share of the normal cost, you get the true normal cost, which is the cost to provide the benefit, the retirement benefit alone. But because we have an unfunded liability that we're amortizing, the, that is the primary driver in the, in the employer contribution rate each year. As you can see, just looking at the teacher line, the unfunded liability portion is 85.5% of the employer contribution rate. So that's significant. The medical subsidy rate is, uh, is significantly smaller. As Marty said, it's because it's a much smaller um, pool of people. It's, it's 10,000 people between current 
retirees who are eligible plus people who are currently working. So it's a very small group and it's closed. And what's different with the the, the medical subsidy that's being paid on a pay-as-you-go basis rather than on a pre-funded basis, which is what our pension, pension benefits are. So this is the FY22-23 um, employer rates. So you can see the total teacher rate was 19.64%. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm sorry, that, that 19.64% is the 24.25, the 21.02 was the 22.23 employer contribution rate. So from the from 22.23 to 24.25, the employer contribution rate went down by a little bit over 1%. The, Net, net change was 1.38%. So that was helpful after the last year, which had been a sizable increase because, as Marty noted, because of the change in the actual assumptions. Next slide, please. So N NIRS, um, the National Institute of Retirement Security, which I mentioned earlier, they're the ones who the, do the pensionomics study every year. They also looked at a bunch of well-funded pension plans and asked, well, why are these plans well-funded and so many other plans aren't? So they came up with six common elements. The first one is that the employer contributions pay the full amount of the annual required amount. And in New Hampshire, we do that. And that they also have stability in the contribution rate over time. So a couple of years ago, you would have said, well, I'm not seeing a lot of stability because we just had about a 20% increase. But now we hopefully have that behind us and there'll be more similar in the future. The next element is that the employee contributions help to share the plan cost. Well, our teachers pay 7% towards their normal costs every year, so they are paying a substantial proportion of the total cost of their benefits. The third element is that benefit improvements are actually valued before they're adopted and they're properly funded. Again, here, New Hampshire does that. The COLA, the cost of living adjustment that was paid to some eligible retirees last week, the legislature is reimbursing NHRS for the full amount of that um, pension increase. The next element is that the cost of living adjustments are granted responsibly, and they are. We don't have automatic COLAs here in New Hampshire. A fifth element is that anti-spiking measures are in place. That was done during the re reforms. And then the last element is that there are economic actuarial assumptions that can reasonably be expected to be achieved over time. Our board and our actuaries spend a lot of time on getting those actuarial assumptions right because they know what a difference and what an impact it has on our employers and on the sustainability of our plan. And our board members work very hard to make sure that our actuarial assumptions are realistic. Next slide, please. So what's important? As Marty says, we've got the, a proper constitutional and statutory foundation to ensure that our benefits will be sustainable well into the future. And that we also, so between the 1984 constitutional changes and the changes that have been made to the retirement statutes, we've, we've paved the way to have success in the future. Next slide, please. So, we don't exactly have a crystal ball, but we do have actuaries who are very good at calculating what the future looks like. So this is what they expect the future teacher contribution rates to be. And this includes both the employer share as well as the teachers, which is the purple part of each of those bars. 
So you can see that the higher rates for 22, 23, and then the slightly lower rates for 24, 25. And then we hope that they will drop again a bit the next cycle, and then stay fairly stable through 2039 when we hope to have been, when we are on target to have paid off that major portion of the unfunded liability. Next slide, please. And this shows how our unfunded liability is expected to get paid down over time. So as Marty said, last year was $5.7 billion because we finally crossed that point in the amortization schedule that the principal on the loan, that unfunded liability, is starting to go down. So we are expecting that if the markets behave and the employer contributions come in every year, we're going to continue to see those the unfunded liability get down until it's fully amortized. Next slide, please. So this is an interesting case study. I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, Maine and their public employees retirement system. Well, they interestingly went down the same path that we went down, but they started that their path 10 years ago. And so it's interesting how similar our two plans are. We've got fairly similar numbers of active members, retirees, our, even our average benefit is pretty similar. And we both have state constitutional provisions that ensure that we will get funded. We're both amortizing our unfunded liability over a reasonable amount of time. We're, we both are using the same actuarial method. And we both have very reasonable rates of investment return that we're assuming. But look at Maine, um, where they started ten, um, 10 years before we started. Their funded ratio at that time was just 51% back in 96. They started going down this path in 97, whereas for us in FY10, we were at 57%. So Maine had an even bigger hole to dig out of than we did. And so flash forward to 2021, and you can see that the, the yeoman's work that Maine has done has paid off. Their funded ratio last year was 82%. So they are well on their way. And New Hampshire, 10 years behind, was at 64% last year. Next slide, please. So, the future, though, is of course uncertain and does have many possible concerns that we have to be on the watch out for. There's always the legislature who may make benefit changes. They may try to make some sort of changes with the COLA. And the closer we get to being fully funded, and if there's a year where there's extra money in Concord, benefit increases are very, very tempting. And there's always concern about whether or not they'll bring in a different type of alternative retirement plan, a defined contribution plan. So those are the New Hampshire state concerns. Then there's the economy. The economy and the investment markets have a substantial impact on what our assumed rate of return is. With all the actions that have been taken by the Fed, we just don't know what is going to happen. And that's why we do an experience study every four years to do a deep dive into all of our assumptions, especially the assumed rate of return. And we'll be doing that at the end of the fiscal year 2023 actual evaluation. So hopefully by then, inflation will have calmed down, the markets will have studied, and we'll be able to come up with some good, solid, assumptions for the next 20 to 30 years. And then there's always the demographic risks that we have. You know, what, what, what's happening? Uh, is longevity increasing, decreasing? You know, we all have heard about all the you know, high rates of death with, with COVID, and Americans are basically not getting much healthier. 
also how the, how is that going to interplay with our plan members? Because it's our plan members whose longevity that determines our liabilities. The school population, you know, we've all heard about many people moving out of New York and Boston. Some of them are going to end up here in New Hampshire. So does that mean maybe someday we will be having more teachers and more school students? You know, that could have an, another impact on our plan and it would be positive. And then there's also the graying of New Hampshire. You know, even though we are getting some influx from the cities, you know, are, are we going to be able to keep more of our children here and working here? You know, we don't have a crystal ball, so we're going to have to see how this all plays out. So, as you probably got tired of t listening to Mario, you probably got tired of listening to me, and at this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have on my part of the presentation. Yeah, I have uh, one question. Um, and uh, I noted that you uh, mentioned um, the changes in the benefits um, for the non-vested employees that uh, in terms of uh, their employment outside or with a uh, contributing um, employer and how that, that was integrated to make um, the, uh, the, uh, the situation more, uh, um, more fun and better to decrease the unfunded mandates to some extent. My question is that I, I don't have, this is a legitimate, I don't have an, an idea as to why this was never done. Um, why is it that the, um, generally speaking, if the top earners who are retirees um, are allowed to continue to work for state and municipal governments as long as they're working um, as a, an, an appointee during a fixed term um, and most of those positions are fairly high paid too um, that would seem to me that that would be a, a pretty obvious cost control measure to uh, take some um, put, attach some limits to that I, I just don't understand that at all that's never never mentioned well, some of the changes that came out of the 2017 decennial commission were changes to limit the amount of work that retirees could do. Um, well, uh, I understand so, that. Yes. I understand that. Um, teachers, teachers, police officers, firefighters, um, they're limited by the number of hours and things. But if you retire as um, what any one of those th those positions, um, you can still take a job that's an appointed position for a fixed number of years and take that in full pay with no reduction in retirement. That's why we have when we list the people that are retired. We have people making three hundred thousand dollars between both between both positions. And um, I, that's never been addressed. It seems, it seems strange. I don't know why that is. Right. And it's not going to tell you that's a policy call. Just... Yeah, well, there's, there's basically what you're talking about is uh, what's, what's called officials appointed for fixed terms. So we, these, by and large, there are some, um, a few outside the state, but generally these are positions that people are nominated by the governor and approved by the executive council for a full fixed term. So most commissioners, deputy commissioners in New Hampshire at the various agencies serve for four year terms. Um, and, and, you know, you know, without, you know, building a time machine, just, just kind of looking at the way, how long that's been on the books and where the structure, I think there's a couple of reasons why the legislature created these carve outs, because they've been around for, you know, if not from the beginning, at least since the 70s in many cases. And, you know, th those jobs tend to be sort of political appointees, you know, and, and you know, well, you know, so, so they, they, you know, they serve for a fixed term. By the time their term's up, there may be a governor of a different party who doesn't want them there. They're not guaranteed, you know, um, a position long enough to vest. So they wanted to give people the option. It's, it's, it's actually, it's not exempt. You can join if you want to participate in the retirement system, but you have that option, unlike a, a rank and file employee. And that, that that's sort of a policy reason why, it would, why that was likely set up that way. And also probably for a political reason, you know, New Hampshire, 
you know, commissioners, you know, compared to their peers in the other states or certainly in the private sector, you know, the, the, the pay bans aren't tremendous. So, you know, I think, I think the state has come to see this as a recruiting tool because a lot of these type of positions that um, they're, they tend to be retired, uh, you know, superintendents, principals, police chiefs, fire chiefs who get these jobs because they're tacking, they're trying to tap into expertise in New Hampshire. And, you know, they, those people could probably do something in the private sector or make more money so the state uses it a way not to pay them as much. But, I mean, that's, you know, but it, it also, you know, the, the political jobs, like if you're a legislative employee, you work for the majority and minority, those are also optional membership positions. So, you know, there, there's, you know, you, you, can, you can assign whether that's a good reason or a bad reason, but those are, those are some of the reasons that I say you're head shaking. Yeah. Yep. You know, and that, and that again, so close that up would really require a change in law and you know, the legislature, it's, it's, it's up to them to do that. I haven't seen any attempts to tighten that up in the time I've been here. You know how much the Commissioner of Corrections makes? Probably 150, 140? Around that probably, yeah. yeah. Um, do you know that every Commissioner of Corrections has been a retired police chief who's um, making um, full retirement benefits. In other words, he retired with full benefits, and they've taken the job as police as uh, commissioner of corrections. I'm only use that as one example. I'm aware, but there are also ones that retire from Group One, doing the same thing. So um, when we're looking at someone that's picking up dead animals off of 93 in Group One, um, and you're limiting them as for how many hours they can work to try to address this deficit that we have. And then we look at somebody else that's going to be making, you know, between both their retirement and their full salary, um, upwards of $300,000 a year. And we look at them and say, ah, you know, that's the way it is, right? It just doesn't seem to me that you're trying to address things on all fronts. Yeah, again, you know, you know that's a policy issue. And, and honestly, from NHRS's perspective, you know, we you know we, we can't take a side one way or the other, but but it is it is problematic for us as a retirement system coming out to events like this because, you know you know you can, a perception can be created that you know people get a deal or these six figure retirees are working in six figure jobs for the state and most normal people don't have access to the, that kind of a, a scenario and so that, I think that puts sort of sort of psychological pressure, you know, in the general legislature about, well, we're going to do something about the retirement system. But honestly, um, more than 94% of our retirees are annu annual benefit is under 50,000, two thirds of them are under 25. So most people who work in public service in New Hampshire aren't getting rich from the NHRS pension. The high earners tend to be people who've worked 30 plus years in senior positions, you know, where we were compensated, you know, commensurate to their responsibilities, you know, but it's a small number. It's like, it's not quite the 1%, it's about the 1.2%, um, you know, in the last number, but, you know, it creates a perception that, you know, there's dysfunction with the system and, you know, that's the way the rules are and the rules could be changed you know, with appropriate, you know, public pressure, but it, it it's in the, in the bigger picture, those people are pretty, um, they, they get more attention than they impact the funding for. So we had an individual at our last deliberative session bring up the point that um, there was a bill in front of the legislator regarding alternative retirement plans. How serious is that really? How, in your opinion, how, how serious are those when they bring them up? Once policy makers look at all the numbers, they realize it usually doesn't work. There have been a few states that have moved over to defined contribution plans and then found out that it really hurt their recruitment and some of them have moved back to a defined benefit plan. The way you pay off the unfunded liability for a defined benefit plan is you have to have new members coming in to help pay down the unfunded liability. If you take away those new members, then you're going to have to come up with money from the current members and current employers to pay off those liabilities. So once you actually look at the numbers, switching to an alternative retirement plan usually does not make sense. Do you have anything to add? 
No, just, just that you know, the reliability doesn't go away if you change the plan for future hires. It's still, it's it's, it's a debt that needs to be paid. So that that and when the legislature, there's been a number of attempts. Uh, those bills like that have been introduced many years in a row. They, they've kind of slowed down in recent years a little bit, but you know, they do they do come back. But just from a cost perspective, it, you, you you're, you're creating two structures and two plans, and there's. there's upfront costs to that that the legislature doesn't want to bear or has, has, hasn't had the, the interest in before. There was only one attempt that made it out of the House and it died in the Senate. Most of them sort of die in the chamber they come in historically. I have a quick question. Um, is, the, uh, is the CIO going to make a presentation too? Uh, no, we're being asked to right now tonight. Okay. He, 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 came to, he hasn't heard this. This is the first of these presentations that we've done since he joined us a month ago. So, right, yeah, yeah. Welcome to New Hampshire. <laughs> I know Connecticut well, so I'll just try and fire at you folks then. Um, I commend you for the uh, for the uh, website. It's fantastic. I, I'm really very impressed with it. Oh, you did? Good. You're hired. Um, okay. uh, it's very, very nice. One area, though, I'd like to see a little bit better uh, transparency um, would be in terms of the actual investment process. In particular, I'm very interested in hearing about some of the uh, alternative investments you're involved in. Are you talking pipes? Are you guys investing in pipes and you know, liquid assets like that, or, or what? No. Um, really, and I, I, thank you for mentioning that because yeah. that is something that Reynold does want to work on: is improving the transparency of our investment assets. So that is something we, that we will be addressing. Yeah. So when I say alternative assets, we mean things like private equity okay. and private credit investments, as well as real estate. That's what we're talking about. Okay. In terms of, I guess, getting more into the investment process, I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds here, but um, what, what type of charter requirements do you have in terms of cash levels? Do you maintain a 100% invested posture, or can you actually go to cash if need be? Um, we do. Um, our target allocation for cash is basically about 0%. The last couple of years, it's been closer to 2% because of the pandemic. We just wanted to have some extra reserve just in case hmm. we will be drawing that down okay notice of the absent was from what i saw uh, any foreign exposure you know developing countries and, and even more established uh, countries is there something preventing you from looking at foreign investment oh no we do have a number of okay. um, foreign investments both um on the stock and stock side as well as on the bond side as okay. well as some of our private equity investments are also international okay uh, there's no hedging activity at all we don't have no. any hedge funds there, okay all right um one other question um that i have here yeah i was very surprised to see the allocation 31 percent domestic equ uh, equity 19 percent alternative investments 10 percent real estate which you can elaborate on maybe and only 25 percent bonds that's that's interesting allocation um Given that we've had a massive run up in bonds since about 1987, uh, and now we're looking at the converse, you know, in particular, what what is the what do you think is going to happen to the bond allocation going forward? That is another thing that Raymond is going to be working on over the next several months. So he'll be working with our um, independent investment committee as well as, our, as well as our staff and the, the, our investment consultant to see do we want to make any changes in our asset allocation. And it's as important as assumptions are, the most important thing our board and the independent investment committee is to work on our asset allocation because asset allocation drives over 90% of investment return. So that's some of the most important decisions the board and the, the IIC make. Okay, and one final question. How many PMs do you folks have? I'm just curious. Uh, how many you have on staff? Oh, on staff, we have a very lean staff. We've got Raynaud, mm -hmm. and we have three investment officers. That's it, and the rest is farmed out. The rest is farmed out. And so mm -hmm. Raynaud is going to be taking a very close look to see what is the best balance? Yeah. 
because yes, you know, farming out is expensive, and so you know, this being New Hampshire, we um, our food but we are also cost effective. So we're going to he's going to do a um, top down look at our portfolio to see if there's any way we can do anything more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. We should expect the continuation of the, of the old risk return and liquidity uh, formula. That always seems to work, you know, making yeah. sure that it's maintained. So, all right, thank you. Thank you for the questions. So you said the, um, you talked about an 8.5% return. If I look at the fiscal year 2020 report, the, the three year, the five year, and the 20 year have rates of returns below 6%, which is below your assumed rate of return. And then last year you had a spike because of the 29% return. You're gonna go negative in 22, and you may go negative in 23 for all we know. And if you read a bunch of investment uh, advisors, they're forecasting the rates of returns over the next decade to be in the four to six percent range. So, are you taking any of that into consideration? Because it seems like if that proves true, the assumed rate of return is going to be still too high. Well, when we come up with our assumed rate of returns to work our actuaries, we're looking at a twenty to thirty year period. So we're, we're not just looking at the next five to 10 years. We are looking at what we expect to have happen over the longer term. And what happens in any given year, it, will, it can vary dramatically, as you saw on that slide with our year-by-year -year returns. So another, just to follow up on what Carl asked earlier, the number of benefit recipients is approaching the number of active members. If the active membership is staying flat and the benefit recipients is increasing, it seems like there's going to be an inflection point at some point in the future. Are you concerned about that? Um, yes and no. The reason why I sleep well at night is that pension benefits are designed to be pre-funded, and that's what they are. We've got an 11, a close to an eleven billion dollar portfolio. So each year we get contributions in and pay benefits out. Um, and I've got the exact numbers here. The, the difference, um, the, the net cash outflow for fiscal year 22 was about $120 million, which is fairly low by many other public pension plans. And as we continue to increase our asset base and reduce our unfunded liability, we will be in good shape. We are, uh, one of the things that actually do every year is cash flow projections. And we are expected to be able to pay the benefits indefinitely into the future. We are not experiencing, we do not anticipate having a cash crunch. Okay, thank you. So it's something we think about and are concerned about, but it, it, it doesn't hamper what we do. We have sufficient assets now, and we'll have them in the future to be able to pay all of the benefits when they are due. Does anyone have any more questions? If not, we thank you very much for your time tonight. That was very informative. And <laughs> We, which is great. We, it was very, it was a great education for us both looking back and going forward as we look at what we need. So we appreciate your time and we welcome you out. And we thank you for working on our behalf to make sure that then, that we can always fund our retirees. Well, thank you for your engagement and all the great questions. Thank you. So at this time it is. Five of eight, we still have some time in our meeting, and I'd like Jane to go over the Pinkerton numbers, the, the assumed rate of increase. We had a bit of a change that this, this group should know about in terms of discussing what the budget should look like. And then maybe after that, we can have a discussion continuing from the previous meeting about if people want to set some target for the administration so we can get a sense of where we want to go. Okay, thank you, Erica. I would just like to, we 
uh, provided a lot of handouts tonight, and they're really more just FYI's. We wanted to give you the uh, minutes to the last board meeting, a uh, budget meeting. I apologize. Uh, we also have the question and answer document, and we also wanted to put in. This is really just informational. If you feel like having. Um, a better understanding of our guaranteed maximum and how they determine our rates. There's some interesting information on the number of claims, what type of claims, prescriptions. Um, that's some good information to read and also the packet from Health Trust again that has the uh, guaranteed maximum and the rates from one year to the next. So we really just wanted to give you those so you have those um, in your packet. There's also another document that I would like to um, go over prior to the Pinkerton one. Um, we are called today and this was a request. It's the document that has, um, it's kind of a spreadsheet here and has, um, it says program number of students 2122. The question was, there was such a an increase in the 23-24 proposed budget with respect to Pinkerton Academy special education compared to what was spent in the last fiscal year. So what Bill and I did, tried to do a, tried to do an easy to understand chart, but just to go through, first column is number of students that were budgeted in 21-22, so you can see resource 301, and goes down with the budget. In 21-22, at the delivery of session, the voters um, voted to amend the proposed budget by reducing it of 300,000, and we took that off the total budget amount under resource. Um, and what we did going across is that you can see, I wanted people to see if the number of students changed from the beginning of the school year at Pinkerton going towards the, to the end. So you can see the first bill that we get, which is a period of 917, they actually bill you for 45 days of um, education. So the number of students that we were billed for was 257, and we had budgeted 301. Now, some people may say, well, that's really bad budgeting, but the 301 were actual students, actually enrolled, and eighth graders moving up. So, um, as you can see, it goes, we have, we have three different billings throughout the fiscal year last year, and you can see that the actual number of students that were built for, particularly with the resource, went from 257 down to 246. At the end, you can see that there was a total amount unspent in last year's budget for Pinkerton Academy by 1.1 million, and all the areas um, that there were, that, um, were not spent in that area. You can see when we reduced the resource line item when you get to the end of the year, we had 17,000 unspent. If you had not removed the 300,000, you would have had an additional 300,000. If you go down to the bottom of the page, for the current year budget, the 22-23, the board last year um, voted to reduce resource by 700,000. And the number of students on the left-hand side, 332, 16, 21, 11, that is what was used for budgeting. Now, when you reduce it by 700,000, that's not an exact number of students per resource per student, so it's just a dollar amount. Um, but the total dollar amount is what was approved, the 6.2 million, and to date, after we had our first bill we received, there are actually 262 students that are receiving resource services. Again, those 332 were actual students at the actual time of October 1 when we did the budgeting. And you can see that's where we are at this point in time. We then went one column over for the proposed budget and Laura Powell is the Director of Student Services has 354 students that she's anticipating to receive resource services, again, based on actual students, um, and what the budget is right now that's um, being brought forward. We did not take any reduction in resource like we have the last two years, but we did um, reduce the assistance 
line item by 400,000. So you can see that the prior year was 1.3 million. This year we've put in 950,000. So I um, appreciate David. You had you had um, asked about doing a, a presentation like this, and I actually think it was a good exercise to show everybody that you know maybe there's some additional areas in the budget for particularly for Pinkham Academy and special education with respect to assistance. We've taken four hundred thousand out, but we did not. Um, touch the resource amount, and as you can see, last year we did not spend seven hundred ninety thousand of resource services at Pinkerton Academy, which could be for a variety of reasons. Obviously, there were less students receiving services, and the amount of time that the um, actual students who were receiving them may have had them for less time than anticipated. So, those are two areas. If you wanted to take a look at those in the interest of time. It can either be a discussion this evening or at the next meeting. Um, with regards to Pinker Academy for general and special education that Erica mentioned, last week they had a sending town meeting. Um, special education, we did budget a 4% placeholder. I talked to Tim Powers this morning, asked him if special education, he anticipated that going up more than 4%. He did not think that that would, so leaving 4% in there would be fine. However, for uh, general tuition for Pinkerton Academy, they were projecting double digits, so they said anywhere between 9% and 11%. Um, so what we did, um, uh, Bill passed out the latest sheet that we were working on right till the last minute before we came here. And what I'd like to do is um, actually show you the back of that page. Every time Bill and I make a change to the budget, we will have it on the back and it'll just be a rolling sheet that will be updated every budget meeting. At the last budget meeting, this board and, and fiscal advisory and administration agreed to remove 35 students from the general tuition enrollment projections. So uh, they did that calculation, so we reduced the budget by 548000 uh, he also put in a 10% placeholder. Now remember, we're going to get the actual rates. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to have it by the next budget meeting, which is November 21st, but um, that rate will be coming out. I normally wouldn't have done a new calculation, but given the large amount of the increase, I thought it would be important so that you could see what we're looking at for cost changes. Um, we did not make any changes to Pinkerton Special Education because he thought that they would be within uh, the 4%. Uh, we also reduced in our budget an additional five special education assistants, which would include the salary and benefits. And um, if you have any questions on that, Laura Powers can um, expand information on, on why we were able to do that. Uh, looking further down, I don't know if Cliff wants to take these two or if you'd like me to just um, keep going. I will keep going then. Uh, we are moving the Chromebooks to SO3. We feel that that's an appropriate use of SO3 money. We have been using SO3 in the past couple of years to support that one-to-one -one initiative. And when looking at areas of the budget, that was an appropriate area that we thought we could move out and um, reduce the general uh, budget. We did add back uh, software for nurses. It's actually it's called a SNAP software, and um, we were going to transition to a power school module that is already in um, software that we're currently using. However, there were um, many benefits that were still with the SNAP software program for nurses, and um, as a group, we collectively um, decided that that was a um, more consistent software for the nurses to use. It has um, connectivity to state numbers and um, updated on the vaccinations and things like that. So we've always used SNAP, so this is just putting it back in. We had taken it out when we prepared the budget, so it's just it's moving it back in. And it's a valuable uh, software for the nurses to support um, the work that they do daily. Uh, moving down, the last item that we did 
Cliff and I have been working on negotiations with for student for transportation. Without any negotiations, we also determined that we would be able to, based on ridership, um, reduce two large buses. And thank you to Cliff for doing that. There's a lot of work. He's um, gotten all the ridership to look to see where we could cut with our transportation. And um, we are meeting with our transportation committee on Wednesday, so we should have lower rates coming into this budget for the next meeting, because as we stated at the last time, 22% was a high estimate, but it was in the range that they had originally given us. But we believe that rate will be um, quite a bit lower. Um, and any other changes we may be able to make for transportation. Jane, can I ask you a question about, um, I guess I'm a little confused on the Pinkerton. So we currently have 262. Why are we putting in this budget 354? Do we really expect 92 more resource students? One of the things that makes it difficult with Pinkerton as far as moving our eighth graders up to Pinkerton and then looking at, you know, how many students are going to be graduating. Currently um, in our IEP program, we have 36 students that are seniors at Pinkerton that are identified. Um, one of the issues is those 12th graders, some of them will be staying because they're in um, the age out at 22, but there are some sophomores and perhaps some juniors that will get all their credits caught up and then be graduating. So the year being a 12th grader doesn't necessarily have a lot of value um, because it could be that they need to make up a, an English class. It could mean that they are one credit shy of being a senior, having senior status, that they can make that up um, fairly easily during the school year. So the numbers are very challenging to do unless I go through every student student's uh, transcripts. So um, certainly something I can do with guidance at Pinkerton is trying to go through the at least the 11th graders transcripts and see how many students are close. Um, but I think that that is one of the discrepancies between taking actual numbers from 8th grade, moving them up, 12th graders moving out, and I take out the students that are in program. There's always more going in that are coming out until graduation day when there's a lot of students that have their credits that I won't, I can't see in anything here. And then the second question I had was related to the Chromebooks. At one of our previous board meetings, we talked about the importance of investing in HVAC and being able to use some ESSER funds for that. Would we still be able to do that if we, if we took this 182000 for Chromebooks, the four or five million we're thinking for HVAC? Um, right, well, we're hoping and anticipating that the amount that will come back from HVAC hopefully will be within the budget and the remaining amount for ESSER funds. I do still have some remaining ESSER funds in ESSER 2 um, that have to be spent by September of 2023, so we can work on rewriting portions of the grant. Um, and again, we also had all of those current positions, the counselor, the nurse, um, the math interventionist, those are all in there for two years. So um, right now we anticipate we would be able to do that. Uh, uh, two last things that I would like to bring to your attention. Uh, both Austin and myself, Joe, we received emails that we would be um, November 10th, we will be finding out the ranking of the school building aid projects. So um, we will get that information to the committee and the school board once we have it on Thursday, which is actually a lot earlier than we originally antici anticipated. Um, and also I've been working with Mark Fleischer from the town um, on tax rate setting. So um, we anticipate that will be coming out soon. And once we have that, I will um, update these projections as well as putting in the new assessed evaluations and uh, projecting tax rate impact. So we, we may not have time today, but I, I think all of us should take a look at for the next meeting is how much more in special education reductions can we with, withhold? Because I think the 400,000 that Jane and, and her team did last meeting is not enough, and we also have to look at what, the, what, what, what we're comfortable with above 35 students. I don't think that's the right number either. I think that's too low, and I would think we should be able to move up higher. And um, 
I mean, we can do that next meeting, or if people want to do it now, that's fine. But I think those are two areas that the changes went over that we need to really sharpen our pencils and figure out for next meeting or tonight if if if, if we have time to do that. I do have one question. Um, with Pinkerton's ten percent increase, you know, next is tied to that, right? Because we our um our costs. No, we we made a change in the memorandum. We understand that their their max would be four percent. All right. Thank you. Uh, one thing just to clarify what I was saying earlier, we have 36 12th graders, we have 84 11th graders that are identified for student services right now. So um, my question for me to find out for our next meeting is how many of those 11th graders will instantly become 12th graders and graduates? Because that really could be the number that is making it so discrepant year to year because there's really no way to predict. Yeah, I, I appreciate the difficulty it, it takes, but year over year, we're consistently over budgeted, and, and we and this is great that Jane did this because we need to find the root cause of why we're consistently over budget and understand that because if we don't, we just keep repeating the same mistakes year over year. And I think we really need to this year more than ever we need to tighten our budgets up clearly as we see we're at whatever it is, 104 million or whatever the number is. But that's I mean, it's one area we can do that, I guess. And one thing with the um, there being extra money in the pairs at Pinkerton is that they just cannot hire the staff. Um, so that number is is not representative of what they need. It's what they have been able to hire. So um, there's a lot of money left over, and that's been for the past few years. Uh, one last thing that Jeremy did want me to mention when we looked earlier at the budget for the maintenance department, when we um, had the roof assessment done, the roofs that are included in year one of the maintenance improvement plan, those roofs are slated for one to three years. So while we would um, like to have a warrant article for maintenance projects, just keep that in mind if, if things had to be moved to a, a different year, those roofs did have a one to three year expectancy. So. Uh, regarding the default budget, you had said that you hadn't come out with that yet because you weren't sure about things. And one of the things you weren't sure about was increases in utilities, which were quite high. Are the increases in utilities in the default budget? Um, yes, I did put the increase in utilities in the default budget, and I consulted with a uh, district attorney on that. Um, the, clearly, there's a case to be made that in order to operate safe and secure buildings, they need to be heat. They need to be heated. They need to have electricity, and we are under contract with um, utility companies in order to provide that service. And with the amount that the increase was, um, I did include those in the default budget. Things that I did not include, remember, are the um, general, the large buses for transportation, general routes cannot be included in your default. So that 22% increase on each of those large buses is over default. Um, special education buses are in default because you are mandated to provide special education transportation but you're not for all of the general reps. So those are things that are over default. And when we, again, increases for non-union staff members, not in default. Increases on health insurance coverage or benefits for non-union staff members, not in default. Any increase on any supplies, equipment, materials, not in default. So there are a lot of things, you're really taking what voters approved in the prior year and adding only things that are contractually obligated, such as Pinkerton Academy tuition, next charter school tuition, anything that's special education related, because those things are required by law. Hopefully that helps people with default. So Jane, are we um, required to transport K to K to eight? You are the answer. <laughs> you're required to transport them, but you're not required to do the distance that we're doing. You're not required to transport high schoolers, and that's why they don't allow the increase to be put under default. Okay, there's a good case to be made by somebody. Maybe me. Um, I tried. <laughs> I'm, I wasn't unable to attend the Pinkerton meeting. I'm wondering what the cause of 10% increase is. Does any, did they give an answer about that? Where was it? 
I didn't. It pretty much word for word for what James said in her presentation is the wage pressures, utilities was a big one, health insurance was a big one. It, it's just the same same thing everyone's experiencing except you know they're they, you know they're passing it along to us. Jane, in your conversation with the headmaster, um, does he give you any sort of guidance in terms of the sending district's population, uh, ex dairy? What's what's happening in those communities? Um, I'm not sure of that, Carl. My conversation with the headmaster was really just this morning. We were in a different meeting about um, uh, trans winter transportation. Um, and so it was a very brief conversation, and I was not at the meeting last week. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if if he mentioned anything about enrollment. So at the meeting, we did um, talk about the, they call the denominator, which is the total number of students, which does drive their tuition costs because some of those costs are fixed and they're not sort of spread evenly among all students. So, um, uh, so they had they projected, I think it was 69 fewer students enrolled next year. So it's pretty small when you consider a uh, campus of over 3,000. I'm not sure what that percent is, but that was the number they gave us on. That evening, 69 for students. 69 across the board. Across the board, all, all seven districts. He did not break it out by district. Hmm. So last year, you took some of the addendum license monies and you applied it to ESSER funds. Are you not able to do that this year? I'm sorry, Bruce, what do you mean? What addendum? So last year, uh, we moved 15,000 for addendum licenses to ESSER. Can we do that this year? The addendum license, yeah. is that what you're asking? Um, you, could, you could do that. That's another appropriate use of ESSER funds. Okay, and then last year, we moved 122,000 of technology software to ESSER. Can we do any of that this year? Um, ESSER funds are appropriate for unfinished learning and for enhancement of student achievement, so those are appropriate uses. I think that we would want to continue to look at um, what the cost is going to be or what we anticipate that cost is going to be for the HVAC systems and repairs. Um, so that's why we're carefully watching what we put into ESSER, but those are appropriate uses and you can do that. Okay. And my, my biggest concern is I look at the revenues down by 1.7 million and we've highlighted in, the, in our letters the last few years that we run a budget deficit that tends to get mitigated by applying unreserved and retained funds to cover that. This year, you're only applying three million, so you're short 1.7 million. Is there any way we can take at least some of the retained funds and apply it to to the general revenue one funds? So, because that works out to be almost a 51 cent increase on the tax rate. You can increase your projection for unreserved fund balance, sure. Um, we also talked as a, as a group of increasing some of our revenue sources, um, increasing, working through the school board policy and increasing rental rates. Um, also, special education, I did increase Medicaid um, this year for um, anticipated revenues, also special education aid. Um, we received a letter that we were qualifying for over a million dollars for this fiscal year, and I will know this week what the state's saying the actual range is going to be. So that's another uh, source of revenue that we may be able to increase. I'm waiting to see what the state says this week. So um, those are all areas of revenue that we can look to increase. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. One more quick one. Um, the largest line item, obviously, is salary and benefits. Um, I, I, I don't know, we've tried to do this in the past, but I, I really would like to reinforce the request or the urgency behind it. Given that it's the largest item, I don't think we have enough clarification or, or clarity into what the trends are going to be in terms of the population of teachers that are going to be retiring, um, what the normal attrition rate would be, they go to different districts. 
I remember asking the question with respect to how many retired this year, but we didn't get an answer to it in terms of what the net benefit would be. I understand that pretty much all teachers now, especially this year, it was hard to hire them. But most of them have masters to begin with. They're not they're not leaving school until they have their masters. So is this Pollyanna thinking that we've got this large population of teachers that are on the top tier of earnings when in fact we're not going to accrue too much of a benefit from that? Or is there you know, some other answer to that? I think it's an important thing that we should know in all of us. And, uh, you know, I don't want to make a lot of work for anybody, but at the same time, it's the largest item. And until we get a good handle on that on a regular basis, it, it makes it difficult. You know, it'd be nice to have some clarity there, as best as it can be. One of the other things that we talked about was early retirement, what we're finding. Mm. And uh, somebody asked the question over here about the health benefit. I think it was you, Bruce, to the uh, people from the retirement system. And we're finding that uh, the early retirement isn't looking as good for some people because they're hanging in a little bit longer because they don't get the health benefits anymore when they retire. So um, sometimes we're finding that some of the people are staying on longer um, to keep their health benefits. It's, it's understandable, you know, but again, in terms of in terms of being able to make some educated assumption as to what might accrue over the course of time, either pro or con, it, it would be it would be a nice exercise, and I think it would help it would help with the whole budgeting process. You know, is this going to result in a savings at some point, or is this something that's just not coming down the road? So there you go. So would you like to see people a, a chart that shows people who are eligible for retirement and see how that goes out? I think Kathy Kennedy has done something like that in the past. I, I would say that you know if you take a look again without getting into too much of a demographic discussion, but you know people are approaching traditional retirement age. Where are they on the scale? Um, you know, weigh in factors like. You know the hiring, the replacement dynamics that are going on right now, which I fully understand. It's the community should understand that. You know, there's not many teachers. It used to be that you'd be retiring at X amount, and you could hire a new teacher for X minus that amount. What are we looking at there now? I mean, it appears as if it's almost a parity. Well, if it's not parity, it's it's certainly not as big a gap as it used to be. Uh, so I think it would be an interesting thing for everybody, and uh, I know it's probably just some assumptions in it, we all understand that, but I think it would be a valuable exercise. So, thank you. Carl, Carl, just to clarify, so are you saying we should be looking at like recent hiring trends and saying, hey, you know, we're hiring teachers at master's level, whatever X, at whatever level, and it's costing X amount of dollars, and then we're seeing an average of X number of employees retire um, at this level, and we're seeing X amount of cost savings? Whether it's national or if, in fact, it's just specific to the district, you know, how many people retired last year, and what did we replace them at, and what projected would be for 2023, 2024, 25, et cetera, you know, what might those look like? Um, yeah. And, uh, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, no, I, I think that would be a good exercise as well, especially, I mean, just understanding who we're hiring and, and what we're able to hire as well, I think is important um, because, yeah, there is a, it's a national teacher shortage um, and there's fewer and fewer college college graduates that are coming into the into the teaching field. So, um, yeah, it is definitely something to consider and we need to get our handle on it as, as much as possible. Um, Moving moving on from uh, from that, I know Bruce uh, had brought up last meeting about uh, kind of a, a, an overall budget number for people to consider um, to kind of help guide the administration in bringing forward a budget. Um, I I, I want to echo that. Uh, I, I think that's really important because uh, I know I can go through some of these items and and we talk about special education, concurrent academy, um, general education, and and find different ways to maybe be creative and, and figure out some budget cuts. Um, but there's going to be some things in here that I, I think I would I would maybe look at and say, well, maybe we don't need X, Y, and Z, but I'm sure the administration would be able to make a good case for why we would. 
Um, so I, th I think I do want to echo Bruce's point about setting an, an overall number. Um, looking at what's approved for 2022, 2023, we see about a $100 million budget. Defaults, $104 million, and we're currently at 107 which is, as we can see from this page here, up 350 from our previous meeting. I think we're gonna, kind of going in the wrong direction. Um, so I, I think that's something important that maybe we should discuss tonight. Um, and that way the administration has the opportunity to come back with plans to say, hey, here's how we cut X amount of dollars um, from this budget that we're able to bring to the, to the taxpayers as something that is palatable. Um, I don't know what anyone else's thoughts are, but I think, I think that's probably a really good use of our, our, our time tonight. Um, and going along in that same vein, uh, we had obviously our, our public hearing last week. Um, we've gotten a lot of feedback. Uh, I think the elephant in the room that we haven't discussed yet is maintenance and facilities and how we are going to uh, kind of progress forward. Uh, I think this year, is this budget is married to whatever facilities discussion that we make, so we have to be cognizant of that. Um, and we do have some major repairs. Uh, obviously, Carl, you had mentioned last meeting that you know we as a board haven't um, followed through on some of the commitments that we've made as a fiscal advisory committee or, or school board previously. Uh, and now it is time to start making those decisions. Um, so I think those are really just my thoughts uh, kind of tonight and making sure that we're focused on, you know, budgeting and, and thinking about numbers, but also giving the administration some, uh, some guidance and giving them the ability to make those decisions uh, because at the end of the day, they're the experts and, and um, I think we should listen to them as well. I think that's ex actually exactly where I was hoping the discussion could go, given that it's 825 and I kind of want to make the most of whatever time we have left. So I did some rough math, and at three cents per 100,000, the default budget is up about $1.20, and the proposed budget is up $2.10. So I don't know how people want to set a number they're comfortable with, but just to kind of ground people, that's kind of where the numbers are now. So if people have an idea in their head based on that 120 120 for default or 210 for proposed where we're at now that they would like to help lead the administration any any leading we could give them would help them make their priorities list and kind of show us what they would do and since it is already early november i agree with john that's something that we should be talking about tonight so how did you come up with the 210 because if it's not if it's a 9.5 million dollar increase in the net assessment that's two point that's two dollars and eighty cents it's thirty. It's three cents per hundred thousand, so thirty cents per million. And the budget total is one hundred seven. No, I'm not. I'm looking at the. I'm looking at the district assessment. That that's what your tax rate is based on. So if the district assessment is an increase of nine point five million, that's twenty. That's two dollars and eighty five cents. I stand corrected. Um, hmm. I was looking at the wrong number, I apologize. So we have 120 for the, oh, seven, so at seven million dollars for the default, which is, that's 210, and then nine for the other one. I think that where I came up with my math, I apologize, was, no, that's okay. I was I, I, no, I actually had a reasoning behind it. I was looking at the increase if you took out a decrease in revenue. I was trying to see what our actual increase in spending was for my own benefit, but then yep. that's not the number we base it on. So we've got um, two, 280 and 210. So do people have a number they're comfortable with or another way they want to guide the administration? I don't know if I can come up with a number tonight, but I think we've got to keep in mind that this year, but this year just the inflation alone has added $475 a month to people's, it's a tax of $475 a month, and next year they're talking 8700 so that's another, what, $600, $700 a month tax. So we got to be cognizant of that in whatever number we come up with. So the other discussion we could have is if people wanted to know what, you know, if we needed to cut a million dollars, what would be the first things that they might think we could live without? There's a lot of ways to get at trying to get 
some information that we may not. And I'm open to ideas. I'm just trying to suggest different ones. I think last week or last session you mentioned increasing the class sizes. I think we have to really consider that. Maybe we got to go with the state class size rather than the school board's class size and see what kind of savings we get. So statewide, we probably couldn't even do the state one because we couldn't fit all those kids in our classrooms. Our classrooms are too small. Uh, they were already above the state average oh, right. across the board. Yeah. Oh, so right. I would think the one of the first things we do is David had already started this project and asked for this chart for the resource members. Um, can you repeat the process for the regular education students at Pinkerton? Um, I think that even though we we don't have a clear cut way to project, we've gotten pretty darn good at estimating the past couple of years. The reason why we can't create a clear cut way to project is because we're dealing with students that we don't have a defined destination for them in school, and you know it's not we're not um, selling cartons of OJ somewhere, so we're not going to be able to get to a process that's perfect. So, but we've gotten pretty good the past couple of years. So I think if we repeat that process that David has asked us to do, we're going to get tighter with that. Um, so I think we have plenty of room with special ed. I think there's probably going to be room with regular ed. You know that help us bring down some. The um, other area that, that, again, is kind of the issue that we're focusing on is maintenance. Um, I just want to remind everyone that we are going to be spending money on maintenance. ESSER is funding us that part for the HVAC, but we are going to be doing improvements that are going to cost the taxpayer um, in a local way zero. Like obviously, national taxes are probably impacted by that. but. Um, as far as our big maintenance projects, uh, if we're getting ranked on the 10th, that's amazing because we have a school meeting the next week and we can discuss that ranking and probably come to some decisions pretty quickly at that point. Uh, whereas before, we weren't going to get the numbers until potentially after the public hearing and the budget and then have to wait for the deliberative and come up with our own changes at the deliberative which could imperil all of our maintenance costs. So um, I think we can get to some decision around maintenance um, for the next fiscal advisory, which will be after our next school board meeting, and we'll have a ranking and probably come to some pretty, uh, a much tidier view. Um, I'm, I'm worried about having this big of a maintenance dollar value in the budget, um, but I'm also worried about having a secondary warrant for maintenance that won't pass um, by reducing this budget. Um, so we're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place there. But I think, again, after the 10th, um, we'll have a lot more clarity. So. Just to further answer your question, Bruce, what, what I was saying about class size is the state, it's, you could put 30 kids in a class, according to them, but we physically can't fit 30 desks in most of our classrooms. But could we increase by, allow it to increase by one student? Yeah, we have six classes, you can do that. Even, you could add one more if you did two, but the state number is not only very high, but it was built for classrooms we don't have. So that, I just want to clarify, that's what I was, I was saying, there's, I personally think there's some room there, but not to the state level, just to a more reasonable level. Yeah, the difficulty with increasing class size, other than losing teachers potentially, is that you may not have, you can't redistrict for one year. So if you have 25, 24, 23, and 22 in grade four, and you say, well, let's just go up because we have to, you know, we have to fit four and a half kids into the other classes. We can't just say, we're gonna just increase by one each grade level across the district. We can't, we'd have to redistrict the entire district every single year to do that. Um, maybe there's one or two classes here or there, so we can go back and look at the additions that was recommended by the administration and see if we really wanna stick with those additions. Do we take out, um, I think there was five increases, four or five increases, so do we take out all of them and just put in two float teachers, which is what we've done in the past. We've had one or two float teachers that go to the most in need class um, so that's a way to reduce it by not really reducing it. Um, but I think class sizes are, are difficult until we, until you actually redistrict and make everything perfect again. And then in five years, you have to redo it again. So, well, I think on the um, class size, there's 
quite a few schools, and I don't have the list here, but that there'd be one, if we got rid of one teacher, there'd only be over by one. And I think that's the question. I don't think we're talking about changing the guidelines, but maybe allowing it to go one over for this year, you know, since the budget is so dramatically high. And I know there, there is a struggle whether you put the maintenance into the budget or as a separate warrant article, um, but then we also risk not having the budget passed. So that's that's the struggle. So the maintenance thing is a kind of a double-edged sword. If you put it in the budget because you want to make sure you have it, and then the budget fails, you can't do the maintenance. If you put it in one article, well, that in the first case because you don't have the money. In the second case, if you put it in a one article and the one article fails you can't fix the roofs unless there's an emergency if you say put roofs in one article because if it fails you can't do it so it's a very tricky situation of how you fund maintenance because we need to fix those roofs so i i really think this gets back to the school board having to do uh, public information sessions with the public if you then if you remember back before barker got built the school board every year came up with a different proposal. Uh, in addition to an elementary school, then it was a new middle school, then it was a combination elementary middle, and then it was something else. And I remember Matt Hanna getting elected to the school board, and I came to my house. I said, Matt, the reason why you're not passing is you change, you come with a different plan every year. No one has, it's like you're on a fishing expedition. I said, you've got to stay with your plan, and then you go to the public information sessions, and he did exactly that. He went at every different school. He had public information sessions, and he gave them the information. And that's what I think sold on Barker in the past. Um, if we simply come up with a budget, whether it's the maintenance is on a warrant article or not, if we just put it in there and don't have public information sessions, I can almost guarantee you're going to fail. So you've got to educate the public, and it's not an easy job, I realize that. But if you're just going to come up with a budget and hope that it passes, you'll probably end up failing. I would 100% agree. I was in that moment addressing roofs because we have to do roofs literally they'll be leaking in if we don't do roofs and they, we have a very specific schedule so which ones will leak in first so the roofs to me are the most critical but you got a problem your default budget is two dollars and ten cents on a four hundred thousand dollar house that's an eight hundred dollar increase on top of the inflation hit that people are taking people are money poor right now and so you have to sell it. Whatever you decide, you're going to have to sell to the public. Mm -hmm. well, I think our key thing tonight is to decide what kind of direction to give the administration in terms of what we can at least start taking out of here, what people are willing to let go of. Not that we want to let go of anything. So I just want to address the going to the public with multiple different buildings. So that was actually a board before Matt and I were elected several years before that the problem was they were trying to find something that would pass the community to get rid of the portables that were here right so there were a lot of different tries um what would pass what wouldn't pass and obviously there were things that didn't pass we formed a committee to look at what we needed we hired john moody god rest his soul right now and um, looked at what we needed to do we had a committee of people who looked at it and um, we looked at getting rid of 36 portables, I think five trailers, and closing Floyd School. But there was a, there was a, a real plan a, and a process to how we got there. And you're right, we were out every single night and every single day talking to people about what we needed and why. We had tours of the school. You know, we did so many different things then, but we really needed to get rid of the portables. They weren't safe for kids to be in at all. So um, it was a process. And, it was a lot of work, but it was good work. So we will, that's one of the big things we're going to be talking about on Tuesday, but a lot of any discussion we have hinges on where we place on that building aid list, because if we don't place high, we're going to have to have discussions about what we do moving forward. Um, but for the purposes of this discussion now, this budget, I think we need to kind of focus on what, what where people want to go from here. So my initial gut reaction is, and this... It's just throwing this out there, and actually Bruce and I talked about this a while ago. Is shaving off five million dollars to get to a dollar thirty-five, which is not great. It's just my starting point. It's a dollar fifty, so five million dollars is a dollar fifty, and we get to a dollar thirty-five, which still is, sucks. <laughs> So 
So do people generally just look at one number or have, I'm open, I just think we need to give them some direction so that we can get kind of a list of prior, in order of what, what would have to go to get to that point. So I did some preliminary analysis prior to this budget being produced. And the numbers I came up with showed about $3 million due to costs beyond our control. Then there was $1.3 million due to the teacher's contract that got approved by the um, voters. And then there's the $1.7 million shortfall in the general one f revenue funds. If you add those numbers up, that's almost $6 million. Um, so uh, it seems to me <laughs> I would go, I would look to cut at least three million out. You know, so I guess we're looking Dave's number is five, so between three and five million, and it's going to hurt. But you also think maybe we could take some from the reserve fund balance too to increase revenue to offset that as well. If the board's willing to, yes. If you take that 1.7 million shortfall, that's because of the budget deficit we've been carrying forward. So if you apply retained funds to that, that will shave that will shave some of that out of there. Yes. So and they also want to use some of their retained funds for HVAC, so I don't know how much is available. Just to correct you, the, the retained funds was not to be used for HVAC. We've had board discussions about using it for maintenance, for roofs and other things, instead of giving it back the discussion. The reason we gave less back this year and held more was specifically because we felt we needed that money for maintenance. Okay. Because the maintenance, if it's not done, will lead to big problems. I mean, I would certainly look at the technology software and the Admentum licenses. If we can put those to ESSER, I would look at that. I would take him or Erica's about increasing class size in one school or for one student. Um, I know another topic that was brought up as well. I know, Jane, you talked about transportation um, and what we are mandated versus what we actually provide um so i mean anything i think from that standpoint i i gotta imagine ridership numbers are probably not at, at where we want them to be um so i think that's something else we need to, that that could be considered that this is kind of what I, I wanted to get away from kind of doing this and making suggestions but i mean yeah i mean that maintenance I, we've got right now the two roofs and the sprinkler system that's one and a half million dollars um i think we either need to offset that with the unreserved fund or retained funds um or we're going to move it out of the budget to put it uh to make a warrant article um i think that I, I think special education i mean again i think once we go and figure out all right well you know we a lot of 332 students but there's 70 fewer uh, at pinkerton um that are resource uh we figure that out i think we can get a, a lot closer to that number um so if that's another i don't know and i don't know what those numbers are going to be but half a million dollars i mean that's two to two and a half million dollars right there that we're already shaving off i, I don't think $3 million is outside the realm of possibility. Uh, I, I know I, I hate doing this too, but uh, I think Ken said that, you know, we have a couple classroom or a couple grade levels that have, I, I looked at one, I think third grade where our goals are 22 apiece. We have 89 students in that. We have, we decided to up a, a teacher from 88 to, for the 89th student. Um, so now we have four classes, or sorry, five classes instead of four classes. Um, so I think there's, I mean, there's definitely $3 million that we can find to take out of the budget, I, I would try and push that a little bit higher if we could. I think and I think one other area I'm curious about, and I don't know if it's possible, but if these are big numbers and if we need to cut big numbers, do we have to provide high school transportation? Could we make people pay for high school transportation? Yes, we could. And I talked about this with the administration the other day. What drives our numbers are the elementary students, that we run five buildings at one time. We have to guarantee five hours of drive time for these drivers. So it's not like you can just cut out the high school or cut out the middle school and save money for that because you have all of most of your drivers driving for the elementary buses. They can't provide driving for themselves. Now, what you could do is charge for the high school and increase your revenue. That is one way you could offset that is to increase revenue for the high school. 
And I'm not saying I'm hugely a fan of that, but when we're looking at these big numbers, I'm trying to like think of things that are realistic. Well, then Manchester does that. I'm not sure if any other surrounding districts do. But what what did you mean by charging the high school? What, what was that? I mean, I mean, yeah, pay to ride. I'm they, sorry, pay to ride. That they would have to pay to ride a bus in the in the well, Dairy Crawford School District, at, even at Pinkerton. Especially at Pinkerton, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't, we can't do that at elementary, though. No. We have to. Well, it's just 9 to 12. I'm always talking about Pinkerton. Yes. It, and I, I think another, uh, with, if we keep coming across this topic, right, we keep coming across or right, consolidation, right, and becoming more efficient with the resources that we have, that, I mean, we talk about classrooms that, I, I think, Steve, you mentioned last meeting that we have, I know 60% of the capacity is filled with actual students versus the, the number of classrooms that we have. Uh, this is going, this brings me back to the facilities discussion where maintaining and operating four elementary schools is going to be far more cost effective than maintaining and, and operating five elementary schools. And that is a very difficult discussion to have, but we've heard it before. We've, we go back to the, to the facility studies that, that we had, like John Moody, uh, he led, and we, we've had multiple people and multiple studies tell us that consolidating the district is is what will allow us to be more efficient and better educate our, our students so that we can, in fact, have classroom sizes that are within our goals and we can maintain those um, in the four elementary schools that we have. Uh, and so, again, I know this is the elephant in the room, but th these are big, strong considerations that we need to make as a board um, because it is not financially. We, are, we we cannot continually to have continue to have these financial discussions where we have a seven million dollar increase in the budget. Um, I know Bruce, you talked about the six million dollars that you know are, are we just we can't even account for um it's it's getting to a breaking point and i know that's an unpopular opinion um but it, we have to consider uh, how we can be more efficient with the resources we have with people and buildings and all, any other resources that we have so it's a quarter of nine at this point i'm not trying to cut anyone off or close any meeting but just being cognizant of time um the idea we have on the table at this point was david brought forth three million um is that a number of people all right so is that is that a number of people is that a range people are interested in seeing at this point or do people, would people like to see something else just to kind of focus given the time uh, uh, we're, so right now we're with the assumed pinkerton increase we're at a little over three million over default is that right three point one million so do we try to get to halfway meet the public halfway knowing that we have a lot of maintenance to do um it's going to be over default. We understand that it's mostly maintenance, so we try to we try to cut that in half, or because I think three million is going to be difficult to find. So. Yeah, but then you got to explain to the public um, how do you justify a six million dollar increase in the net assessment that gets back to selling it? If you don't sell it, agreed, you're not going to pass it. I, I, I have faith in personally, I, dollar and cents, you know, I, I know a lot of elderly in the community, they're having a very tough time, uh, even young families, everybody. Um, but, but I think if the appeal is made in a manner that is respectful of the situation we all find ourselves in right now. I think the community, as it always has, will rally around, whether it takes the form of having to pay for bus transportation, whether it takes the form of, you know, a cuts made to various positions, there's going to be people um, upset about it, um, you know, but, but that's the job of, I think, the elected officials, that's what you got elected to do, you have to make the case. and. Uh, 
I don't think anybody's going to begrudge you what the realities we're all facing right now, whether it's your own heating and water bills and uh, everything. You know, interest rates gone crazy. <clears throat> I think people will, they're not going to be happy, but I think they will support, you know, what it is that has to be done, you know, and they'll find a way to adapt. I think the other thing too, and the two hundreds and everybody. I agree. I think the other thing to remember is that these numbers we're looking at are without warrant articles, and we're going to need some kind of warrant article for maintenance. No matter what we do, we need some kind of warrant article for maintenance because the maintenance we've got in here is some very specific maintenance, but we need more than this. It just is. We need more than this to keep our schools running. So this is just part of the number. So I think we need to think hard about what. We just need to give some direction. Yeah, because you, if the roofs are repaired, what what is the number of years that that capital expenditure is going to be, you know, going to have a, a life extension to the facility that it's put on? What is it going to equal, you know? So, Erica, um, I am trying to schedule, well, she's tentatively scheduled um, Renal Lulier for, she's one of the bond attorneys. And she's tentatively scheduled for the November 21st board uh, budget meeting and um, to give the board a brief update on if the board and the fiscal advisories um, choice was to go out to bond on any maintenance. You seem like the 25th or 26th. We don't have a meeting on the 21st, I think. No, we have one on the 15th and the 29th. The um, budget. Budget. Oh, fiscal advisory, sorry, I'm mixing dates. Too many dates. Sorry. This discussion is exactly how maintenance gets cut every year, right? We're here. We need it. We have these increases. How do we balance it? Every single year. This is how it happens. Just keep that in mind. I would think that most of us agree when we're talking about finding things to cut. We are not saying to cut maintenance, unless anyone disagrees. If we're going in any direction, I mean, I'm, I am. If we were to put it as a warrant article, then yes, I would be fine with that. I have, I, I do trust. Kind of, I'm kind of going off of uh, Carl that I do trust that the feedback that we've heard that you know people want to make repairs to the buildings that that would be a good use of our money. Um, is but and that is a specific warrant article that says, hey, we the taxpayers want to spend X amount of dollars. Um, on these specific projects. So I would be fine with pulling out maintenance that way, or if we were to offset the maintenance costs with the retained funds. Yeah. I would say the difference. We agree, Jonathan. It's a miracle. For once, we agree. Yeah. I would say the difference this year from any other year we've discussed budgets, and I'm new, obviously, to town, but we've never had, had a conversation about the capital reserve until recently which is shocking, but that's a whole different conversation. But I think that's different, right? We have never really pushed forward to cash with capital reserve. And, you know, now we are. So that's one difference. And like John said, well, we can fund, we got $2.5 million right now. And, you know, we can add more if need be, I guess. But that's kind of one different, I would say, now, between now and previous. I'm sorry. Are we looking at a spread between uh, five and three million? Is that what it was? The, you know, both of your suggestions. Then Derek suggested something even less than that. Yeah. I'm wondering if that spread could be narrowed to the middle, and then maybe do three quarters of a million up or down on either side. You know, because that's a that's a pretty big spread. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know if people agree with that or not. I don't know if you. Well, I think um, yeah. maybe if we pick two numbers, three is a lot of work on the administration. Maybe if we pick two <laughs> in a short yeah. time. I'm new, but it appears we already kind of already have a target in the default budget. So I know you said at the last meeting that we're definitely going to be over the default budget, but. If we are over, are we going to put that on the ballot? So if we don't bring in something that is at least at the default budget, you might end up with that. No, 
in the clothing. I think there's probably room at Pinkerton that, that will help um, remove some of the um, monies people are looking for to remove. And then if we do pull out a good part of that maintenance into a warrant article and let the town speak for what they want to see, um, then that brings it down a pretty good amount. So. And just to answer your earlier question, Stephen, if we take things, say, out of Pinkerton, that comes out of default and proposed. So it's not, you can't just look at it that way. You, you mentioned that the, there's money in the maintenance that is not included in the budget that you would like to include in a water article as well. Is that correct? We don't have an exact amount, but we need other, the, most of this money is in here is just roofs and some critical things, but there will, as we're going through this facilities process and depending on where we land on this list and what the board decides going forward, it is critical we do other maintenance projects or have some kind of fund to do them. How much has to be determined? So, so by the next time we meet, that could be included. And if you have new numbers, that this number could go in the opposite direction as well. So we will get the two dates we're looking at as a board are on the 10th, we'll know where we land on the building aid list. And at the end of November, we'll have we'll have data from Jobin, which is, they're an estimator. They don't do any work. All they do is estimate what needs to be done. So by the end of the month, they'll tell us, in our seven schools, what are the critical things that need to be done and what will they cost? They have no role in doing any of the work. All they do is estimate, like the roof people. That second set of data will be really critical for us as a board going forward to determine what's most critical and what we need to do in this budget. I just can't give you specifics because we don't have that till the end of the month. So there's two things this month we're waiting on. Does that help? Um, no, it, it adds a lot of ambiguity. Unfortunately, yes. Today that we could be targeting three million. We don't have that information but, right. Yeah. On the, the one to three years, you said that it, 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 they are critical that they be done immediately. I, I, yes. I nobody wants it. Yes. But what was the one to three year on the roof? The roof, the roofs and the maintenance improvement plan that that's in your yeah. in your budget. Um, I believe the from the roof assessment from AIM consultants, the roofs that are in the twenty three twenty four year are actually um, need to be replaced within one to three years. So you have a little wiggle room if you had to move it off another year, um, but we did put those one to threes in year one. Okay, that, that's what I was just trying to reconcile. Is it immediate, they're leaking, they're... Yeah, so what we did... Or is there a one to three year... Yeah, plan? so what we did was the roofing consultant recommended, it was around, I think around $200,000 for remedial maintenance, which would keep the roofs in order, which would then put them in, okay, now they'll hold on until you can replace them and until you can replace them depends on which roof so there's ones that are one to three there's ones that are three to five there's ones five to seven and there's some that go further out but that that was how that was determined so we've done what needs to be due to hold over till we replace them but the next step has to be replacement yeah i was just eyeing that last year the debt service this year you have a million dollars that you'll be you know, is there an opportunity to, you know, hold one more year for a roof and use that debt service reduction that you're having next year, peg it in, obviously, we're, that you'll have the same discussion next year, you want to use it for many other things, I'm sure. I personally think that would be a pretty dangerous proposition given how many years we put off replacing these roofs. 100%. I'm just understanding two different sides of the story. If it's one to three years, I, I, I appreciate that. Information. To make it more interesting, the one to three year roofs are DDS and SRS, so... Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, it, again, it's a pressing, it's a pressing issue. I, I, going off of what Bruce said, again, we have to, we have to put together a comprehensive plan that speaks to and is married together with whatever we decide to put on the warrant. Right? We've already, already voted to go after new school building aid. We need to now figure out plans that are complementary to that. So when I look at the maintenance improvement plan, I, I, I think those are minimums that have to be done over the next. 10 years, um, not just the next five years. Uh, once we get back the German estimates, uh, again, we're gonna have to figure out what 
the continuation is. But again, I agree with Bruce that you know if we if if the board the school board along with the administration deems that a new school is the best option moving forward, then the other warrant articles that we place in conjunction with that need to be complementary to that. So um, it would be let's do the repairs on the schools like like we have here west and and hood um and then the fire alarm upgrades uh and then that would give us the ability to have that comprehensive plan and go to the public whether it's potentially this march or if we decide to hold off depending on the ranking and continue to have these informational sessions and be very prescriptive about it um and i know it's kind of getting away from budgeting but i just think we have a lot of work to do so I wonder if at this point we could maybe go to Derek's suggestion as a starting point because you know there's three million dollars in here for maintenance and where we put that in here or someone else isn't we could keep talking but even if we started with the 1.5 million Derek suggested or if people want to up it to two what would that look like at least that would give us a starting point of some things because I think at this point the numbers are high enough we need some kind of starting point to see the what the administration would do since we can't go we're not skilled to go through and cherry pick I don't know if anyone would post Derek's suggestion so if you want to speak to it Derek so yeah, I don't think I think if we ask the administration to come up with three million, it could be a combination of pulling maintenance out and then letting the voters decide what they want to pay for it. Pinkerton, there's room. They can make recommendations on reducing students and dollar amount, dollar amounts, um, reducing teaching positions if they see areas where they could do that. Recommendations as to what that how that would impact the class sizes. The, the individual principals should be involved because they're going to know the makeup of those classes and whether or not that grade level can handle it. Um, it's not just a matter of, you know, people, they'll, they'll deal with one or two extra students in a room, though, if that room, if that grade, which we know certain grades at certain points in time, can be somewhat more um, challenging and more um, energy required. Um, then we may shoot ourselves in the foot and have to hire an assistant. So if we can even find an assistant, um, but I think if we want to start with three, that's fine, and we can go from there. And I think I think, I think clarity will come with some of our decisions on Pinkerton numbers, and more clarity will come after the tenth. I I've, I've been feeling very uh, scatterbrained, I guess, because knowing we weren't going to get um, ranking until January, like. What does that even mean? Like, what, how do we even know? I I didn't feel so, um, I guess, scatterbrained about not knowing the maintenance cost until December, just because we're going to come up with a figure here we think that the budget will handle. That those dollar values we get in December from the estimator are really just going to form our plan for the next five, ten years. It's not going to be we have to have those numbers to make this decision. Um, so I think three million is fine to start with. But I would also reiterate my request that I make every year the five-year budget plan that I ask for should be a living document updated each and every year. So as we push things off, we get some visibility in how it affects the next 10-year budgets. And right now, we just have a five-year plan that was a one and done, so we don't have that visibility into the future budgets. So that is part of, so the, I looked through the last six years of annual reports and the three things that were brought up by fiscal advisory each year, the first one was come up with a maintenance plan. We have a five-year maintenance plan. The second one was address facilities. We're in the process of addressing facilities. Once we make some critical decisions about facilities, those decisions can be fed into, with the maintenance plan, what will become a five-year budget, which would be a real living document because we would have a real plan based on whatever we decided. So we are making progress in all the areas that, or heading towards getting the answers we need to make that progress. So those were the three things named. I did look through all of those this weekend. Quick question for Jane: um, How much? How much more time on Barca in terms of the uh, debt service? One more year. One year left. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's 23, good. 24 is the last. And what, what are we, how much is it per year? I'm being lazy. I get things. 1.2 million. Per, per year? Yeah. And that's not reflected, I mean, that's reflected in our budget as an ongoing obligation for fiscal. So we got a million dollars coming free, right? It's just, 
I'm sorry? After this budget. After this budget, right. Mm -hmm. It's a million dollars, you know. So are people... We have refinanced, I should say, wish we had financed them so years ago. No, I'm not refinanced, I'm saying I wish we had done this. Are people before. comfortable with asking what three million would look like and seeing... So I think that that is your charge. It seems like people are, you know, we've talked about a lot of different things tonight, but you guys are the experts and you can take a look and tell us what combination of things you think would still best be able to give our students what they need. And they're obviously all incredibly hard decisions, but we need to start somewhere. Um, and this has been a very long meeting, but I really appreciate everyone's questions and input. And please remember to always send your questions as soon as you can after these meetings so they have time to compile the answers before the next meeting. Okay. Okay. I apologize to everybody. I need a minute. Um, so if you were here last Wednesday, general consensus over that period of time was don't close anything. Don't build a new school. Keep everything open and repair them. So, from the people that were in the gymnasium last Wednesday, they seem to be willing to pay whatever needs to be paid to keep our neighborhood schools and keep all of our schools open. People who showed up. Um, there weren't very many phone calls that I know of. I don't know if there were any, I don't know how many emails we got, but that's what I got out of last Wednesday. Now, administration has already started to look at things. My suggestion, because we've done this before, and Erica, you talked about this a couple of meetings ago, that we come up with this number. What are we going to do? We'll cut in place. Uh, we're going to talk about... Um, any number of things, one of which from our principal group, the last things they want to hear about in this market, and the social, emotional, and so forth is increasing the sizes of the classes. But my thought process was to come up with a number, which we begin to do, which shows a thought process, which might be a revenue stream, which Cliff already talked about, as far as busing, charge high schoolers for their bus ride if they want it. Um, and how much impact would it have on the budget? It will save this amount of money or it will generate this amount of money. And what impact will it have on the schools and so forth and so on. Um, because if we're going to put class size in there, we can say if we did one, one, two, 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 we would say six teachers, I believe. So there's a, there's a price on that. But we would also put an impact statement on that as to what we believe and how it would believe it would impact the schools and the classrooms. And we've already started to generate all sorts of things, like um, don't bust people for... We could save Cliff, I believe you said the number of buses was pretty substantial if we went to um, two miles instead of one mile. We need to start looking at all of these things um, and talking about pay-to-play -play again, talking about all sorts of things. Because when we start talking about class sizes, I've heard this group before say, keep it as far away from the students as possible. That's about as close to the students as you possibly can get. So my, I, will, I will keep the three million, or whatever that figure was in the back of our mind, but we would prefer to create a menu and say, these are all the things that you guys have mentioned. These are the things that we have thought of. These are the things that our principals brought to the table uh, when we met um, last week. 
and show the uh, money and show the impact that we believe so it would have. It's, I, I think what you're hearing from people at this table is if you want to create a menu, that's fine, but it's got to be in priority. We need some direction. What are you most willing to let go of and what are you least willing to let go of? It can't just be a list with costs. You need to give us some sense of it needs to have ranking. Well, in our opinion, the impact statement on our schools and our staff and our students would be in a, would be a, right now it's in alphabetical order, starting with bus transportation, so moving down the line, class sizes and and um, cutting pace and and pay to play and so forth and so on. Numbers of things that we've talked about before. Um, with an impact, and then it, because I do think, you know, it, when, you, when you talk about raising class sizes, it's easy to look at a figure because it's a big figure. When you start, instead of adding three teachers, you're reducing six, that's a huge swing. And it adds up to a lot of money when you start adding the salaries and benefits and so forth and so on. But we need to look at impact, and we need to know, you know, look what's going on in our schools, and the reason that we have a, a extra councils now, and so forth. The reason we thank God Almighty we hung on to the um, home to school coordinators with what's going on in, in society and with our poor kids and what they're dealing with and coming through the pandemic. So, you know, let us at least produce this menu, produce the impact statements, um, and then uh, let's talk about them, and then maybe if there's a need from there to come up with um, what we feel would be prioritizing, I'd rather wait. So I appreciate you wanting to wait, but we don't have a lot of these meetings left, so we, we need to see some priorities. Because we, just we don't have a lot this, of meetings left. I'm looking for this group to start talking about what their priorities are. But you, we've, we've given priorities before in the past, in my opinion. So the but first, that's what you want us to do. That's yeah, so the do. first round of this budget was your proposed budget. Now we need to hear some priorities because the meetings are getting closer and closer to the end, and we need to make some hard decisions. And since we're not the educators, we need to hear what least affects students, what are you most willing to get rid of, some, we need a little more to go on because we don't want to be example that always gets taken off the table. We're one of the only districts uh, around that has a program for high achieving students. Do I think it is fantastic that we do that? Absolutely. But if I'm going to talk what's going to affect 150 kids or what's going to ha affect 3,000 kids, then you, those are decisions that you do. I want to not have a place program. I think it's fantastic, and I think what it does for those students is fantastic. But if you want to look at impact, the numbers of students that we're impacting for that program and the numbers of teachers that we employ for that program I, I've said it uh, so many times at these meetings. When you go from um, uh, two miles to one mile, that costs money. That costs a hundred and it costs eighty something thousand dollars a bus. And there's a lot of buses. And, and I, I do understand that. that this, is the, this is what we want to hear from you. What is it? We, we want some priorities so we can have a discussion. That's the exact thing we want to hear. Cause, or different people want to hear things, but we need some direct Brenda. Fair enough. We so do that. the bottom line is your priorities are right here. You gave them to us already, right? Yes. This isn't a big fluff budget. It's mm -hmm. what the priorities are for our students. Class size impacts learning. We keep demanding learning. We keep demanding better test scores, but let's in increase class size. That doesn't make sense to me, right? But there's so many things that we ba bounce back and forth. It goes on year after year after year. The same thing. Cut, make Increase class size. Close the school. Add whatever program. Take that program away. Add maintenance. Take maintenance away. 
where, where the rubber meets the road. We've said this, I don't know where Ken is, but we've said this for a long time. Sooner or later, we're going to get here, and we're here. So I'm personally not willing to give up anything that impacts children, and that's most of what's in this budget. How do we fix that? If I win Powerball tonight, guess what's happening? All of these problems go away. But that's probably not going to happen, although I'm trying to think positive, right? I don't know where you're going to cut, but I don't, I don't think I have the knowledge to tell you where to cut either. I don't have the knowledge or the, the information about students in whatever class. Say we're, we're looking at this school. There's so many sixth grades. Some classes have 25 students in them. Some have 12. Why does that class have 12? Because there are children who have special needs, have special equipment, have all kinds of other, other things that need to go on, so their class needs to be smaller. There's also more adult bodies in that classroom that take up the space. So we talk about the same thing all the time. What's in the class? How do we make that work? I don't know. I don't know how you're going to do this. I agree with Jonathan. I, I think we should take the roofs out of the budget. Um, and put them on a warrant article. I'm willing to talk to people. I'm not going to call it a sales pitch because that's not what I like. I like people to understand what we need, and I'm happy to do that, take that on. I also agree with some changes in Pinkerton, um, and I'm just going to leave that right there, but I think we can make some changes there as well. But making an impact on, on student learning, especially when it, the, the flip side of that is, what are you doing about that? What are you doing about test scores? Busing, we've talked years before about cutting the high school transportation. What's the result of that? Do students go to school? We want them in school. So there's an impact to that. And Cliff's already said the high school buses are not what impact us. It's the elementary kids. Uh, some of our routes are very rural. Do we want a kindergartner walking two miles up whatever road, Frost Road or Island Pond Road? I don't. So there's, there's so many trade-offs that we have to make, and I don't, I don't know where that is. I'm sure there are bus routes that can be changed, but I don't know how many of them there are because we have a lot of rural neighborhoods and a lot of homes on roads that are dangerous to walk on. So you have a tough job, but I just want to make it clear that I understand this budget is what you need. Where we go from there? I'm just going to say I'm going to leave it in your capable hands because I'm not making that decision. So we will uh, create a menu and we will create priorities within that menu and we'll have that for the 21st. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything else before we close this meeting? If not, thank you all for your time tonight.